that's what I write about. Mm. I've written, I think I've written about 15 books, but the four best selling ones are the mm. ones about paleo contact. Mm. That's the theory that in the deep past, our ancestors had contact with other civilizations, with mm. ET visitors. But by really into it often surprises people. Mm. This is from the world of Christian ministry. Mm. And I was for 33 years in church based ministry. I was an archdeacon mm. in the Anglican Church, which is the Episcopalian Church okay. here in the USA. In the stories you tell from the Bible, it was leading to a completely different storyline mm. that turned out to be the summary form of the Sumerian stories wow. of our ancestors' contact with sky people. And so it was a few years ago that I, I reached that tipping point of realizing I, I have to put all my energy into this yeah. because the way it changes the narrative mm -hmm. for humanity is so important. I can't sit on this information that I can right. live with myself. Hey everyone, it's Billy Carson, AKA Forbidden Knowledge. I'm here with an amazing guest and a great friend of mine, Paul Wallace. He's a four times best-selling author of the Eden series, these amazing books, and stay tuned for book number five. He's also the host on the Fifth Kind YouTube channel, which is an amazing YouTube channel, which is just about to hit 1 million subscribers. So make sure you like and subscribe. He also has the Paul Wallace channel, which is incredible. You want to check that out as well. A fast growing YouTube channel there. And of course, paulanthonywallace.com to get more information about all of his appearances and all of the work that he's done. He's an incredible human being that's done a lot of work in the, in the community, as well as he just came here to my house to film the Forbidden Solutions for Humanity roundtable discussion that we just had the other day. So welcome, Paul. Good day, Billy. All Great right. To Great to be with you. First, tell everybody where you came from to get here. Oh, well, I, I've flown from Australia to be here, so I'm not sure what time zone I'm in right now. So mm -hmm. between Australia and Florida. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's been a great pleasure. I've met some fabulous people and really enjoyed the Forbidden Solutions conversation. Yeah. Oh, it was amazing. That Forbidden Solutions was really, really powerful. I went back and watched some of it from the live stream, and it's like, wow, a lot of gems. Just, in, just for you, you know, viewers out there, we we got together. Paul Wallace, uh, uh, Michael Beckwith, Zeke from New Era, uh, his, his name is actually Isaiah Williams, and then myself, Billy Carson. We got together in at a roundtable discussion here, and we set up a studio in my house, and we literally went around talking about the greatest problems facing humanity, or at least some of them, and we talked about solutions to those problems, so that we could begin to manifest solutions to problems instead of only focusing on the problems, because we truly believe that when you what you're focusing on is what you're going to get back. So if you focus on solutions, we should begin to see solutions coming back or hoping to make it a very vital thing so that everyone can begin to have these conversations. I love that conversation because I think there's a lot of anxiety mm -hmm. in the world of the low and, and coming here and turning the TV on, um, I'd be really shocked how much anxiety <laughs> and worry yeah. broadcast on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. There's so much uncertainty as to how geopolitical things are going to play out in mm -hmm. the next few years. And I think we need to be proactive in building a better atmosphere yeah. and having better conversation from mm -hmm. one another so that we actually feel equipped yeah. to meet the world and we're proactive in terms of what world we're creating exactly that was the context i think about conversation the other day yes so powerful and so appropriate if you want to watch that forbidden solutions for humanity make sure you go to 4bk.tv or go to your app store and look for the forbidden knowledge with the number four forbidden knowledge tv app and install it and watch the forbidden solutions for humanity 
along with 3,500 other amazing episodes of content that's up on that TV network, all right? So, Paul, you came all the way from Australia here. It's a long trip. <laughs> I've made that trip before. It can make you, uh, you know, very, very jet lagged. It knocks you about. Yeah, it, it sure does. But you're here now and you've been putting in a lot of energy out and we appreciate that. I'd like the people who, you know, from my channel, who are just kind of finding out who you are to know a little bit of your backstory to kind of see, like, how did you even get into ancient civilizations, religion, spirituality, and all the other things that you're interested in? Well, I mean, people do they know me as the pay your contact guy. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what I write about. Mm. I've written, I think I've written about 15 books, but the four best selling ones are mm. the ones about pay your contact. Mm. That's the theory that in the deep past, our ancestors had contact with other civilizations, with mm. ET visitors. But why I into it often surprises people. Mm -hmm. This is from the world of Christian ministry. Mm -hmm. And I was for 33 years in church-based ministry. I was an archdeacon mm -hmm. in the Anglican Church, which is the Episcopalian Church okay. here in the USA. Archdeacon is one down from a bishop, but it's a kind of a church doctor role that I fulfilled for a number of years. And I was a theological educator. I was training pastors. Mm -hmm. So this sounds quite different to <laughs> yeah. see contact and uh, human origins. But it was the theological educator role that actually led me into the world of E.T. Coltac because I was teaching pastors the principles of the Kimberley ancient texts. Yeah. And so we do source analysis, form analysis, all the essential linguistic questions of what do the words mean. Mm -hmm. And I was finding that whenever I applied those questions to things that don't quite make sense in the stories you tell from the Bible, it was leading to a completely different storyline mm. that turned out to be the summary form of the Sumerian stories wow. of our ancestors' contact with sky people, <laughs> or what today we would call aliens or yep. ETs. So it was actually my work within ministry that led me into ET contact. And as I studied that through the root meaning key words, I realized there's a straight line between that subject and human potential. Mm. Because if our origin story is different, yeah. who we are is different. Mm. What we're capable of changes. And so it was a few years ago that I, I reached that tipping point of realizing I, I have to put all my energy into this yeah. because the way it changes the narrative mm -hmm. for humanity is so important. I can't sit on this information that I can right. live with myself. As I, I really have to take my life in my hands, knowing that if I started publishing what turned out to be the evil series, that would totally redefine how I earn my living. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally change my social circle. <laughs> yeah. And I knew that a lot of friends and respect, professional credibility that I built up on the 33 years mm -hmm. just gone. Like vanish. That. But it was too important yeah. not to address it. So just to take a quick break, a lot of you have asked me in the chat. You know, well, you know, how come you don't never have a, have a, a person from religious or, or, or a pastor or a reverend or a minister on your podcast? There he is right there. We also had Reverend Michael Beckwith here. That's right. Two reverends. Two reverends in the same room at the same time talking about the problems for humanity. And of course, you can hear uh, from Paul here, Mr. Wallace, that uh, he was heavily involved in the church and probably still is, but saw something else. And it's something taboo. Mm -hmm. And what I've found, I've been really surprised since publishing Escaping from Eden, mm -hmm. I've been contacted by so many people mm -hmm. who are in communities of faith. Mm -hmm. They're in churches. And either they've had close encounter experiences mm -hmm. and suddenly they realize they're not allowed to venture that. You have all sorts of other supernatural experiences in a church, but don't mention ETs. Mm -hmm. Or they seen things in the Bible in the same way I have. And mm -hmm. they thought, wait a minute, that's a close encounter. That's a UFO, that, that's yeah. contact, that's colonization. Mm -hmm. I then found in a Bible group with that pastor, oh, you, you don't mention that again if you want to stay in this church. Right. <laughs> and they're totally isolated. And they could be off-sided from their entire family mm -hmm. if they start talking about these things. So yeah. they reach out to me. And often I hear from people, they may have had a close encounter experience mm -hmm. when they were 15 years old, mm -hmm. and now they're 65. And they still haven't been able to process it. Yeah. They've never had anyone they could talk to about it. Exactly. They haven't discovered all the communities on YouTube 
full of experiences, mm -hmm. but they see me and they thought, I, I want to tell that guy. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of the time I'm hearing experiences that are decades old that mm -hmm. people haven't felt before in the share. It's a taboo subject, you know, but our churches are mm, at least half full mm -hmm. of contactees and yeah. experiences who just haven't been able to come out the closet. That's so true because it's such a taboo. You can be excommunicated. You can be ostracized. Right. So it's a tough thing to talk about, especially, you know, in the black and brown communities. It's almost like you dare not even bring anything up about a UFO or an alien. At least when I was growing up, you know, in the 70s and 80s, it was like a topic that was really taboo, you know, and um, uh, and hard to talk about. So people go for decades, literally, with this information and this this thing on their consciousness, but they can't seem to find any way to get it out to at least just express it to somebody that would listen without judging them. Exactly. And that can go for generations. Mm. I mean, I often hear from people, uh, guys will talk to me who might be in their 30s. Mm -hmm. They'll say, I've had this experience. They'll describe a close encounter, an abduction experience even, mm. but they'll want help processing it. And I'll say, are you the first person in your family to have had this experience? Mm. Uh, have your parents had anything like this happen to them? And they'll say, oh, I don't think so. I think mm. like, well, the dad would have mentioned something like that. <laughs> And then a week later, they'll call me back and say, uh, I read you to my dad and he said, well, son, since you said that, let me mm -hmm. think what happened to me when I was 15. Mm. And they've kept this story. They haven't shared it because they wanted to protect their kids. Yeah. They didn't want their kids to think they were crazy. Of course. They didn't want anything disturbing to happen to them. So just steer them away from the whole topic. Mm -hmm. But it's actually uh, impoverished the family because yeah. there was information there. Mm -hmm. They could have prepared their kids for these experiences. Yeah. The kid could have had uh, a less isolated, happier life if they'd known, mm -hmm. hey, this happened to dad. Yeah. He's okay. Yeah. We will also buy this. Mm -hmm. And sort of breaking that taboo within a family can be really awful. Yeah. But the other thing, I'm really excited about my latest book, The Conspiracy, because mm -hmm. it shows that in the Bible, the narrative originally at the Hebrew yeah. switches was one of paleo contact. Mm. It's one that talked about the Tzeba Hashemayim arriving. Mm. And that's the Hebrew for the sky armies. That's right. Turning up. It talks about invasion. It talks about the parceling up of the lands. Mm -hmm. El Elyon gives all the lands to the Elohim. Yep. It's a moment of colonization. Elohim is plural. Elohim is plural. The powerful one. Yeah. And when you read it that way, the stories make sense. Suddenly it makes sense mm -hmm. why the Yahweh character is trying to get land off the other powerful <laughs> ones because he didn't get any land. Yeah. He got a people group with no land. Mm -hmm. So when he turns up in the story, he has to take his people out of somebody else's land. Until you've got that framework, you don't understand what all the wars are about. Yes. But worse than that, most Bibles translate Elihim as God. Mm -hmm. Singular. Mo singular. Right. Most believers look at El Elion, they think that's God. They read Yahweh, they think that's God. Mm -hmm. And the story that produces is a time from distortion. Yes. The dying of God a God, he goes to war with himself. Yes. Thousands of humans get killed, get slaughtered <laughs> when he gets into conflict with himself. Yeah. He changes his mind. And so there's a genocide in the process. Mm -hmm. And so we end up with this monstrous image of a God. Yeah. And it affects how we think about ourselves. Mm -hmm. We become these servile little creatures tiptoeing around, desperately afraid we might offend the Almighty, right. make a mistake, fall out of His will. And it is so disempowering. Mm -hmm. You go back to the original meaning of those texts. Mm -hmm. The Bible is an empowering document. It's talking about people power. Yeah. It's talking about the power of the human being. And you read those stories realizing our ancestors went to great lengths to get this information to us so we could know what our true power is. Yeah. And then along the way, editors, redactors, let's change how that's told. Yeah. And they turn it into a story that suppresses us and makes us manageable. Right. There's a remix going on. <laughs> In music, they call it a remix, right? <laughs> and so what's, what's really sad about it is it gives us, like you said, this different perspective of what a true, all-knowing, all-loving God really is, which I personally believe exists. Yes. However, the, I keep trying to tell people that the one that you're reading about in this book, or the ones, I say plural, yeah. they, those are people that masqueraded as God. Yes. They allow the people to praise them. Well, yes. I mean, that's half the story. And yeah. the other half of the story is that in the 6th century BCE, these editors sat down and they got now a word that's understood mm -hmm. to mean God, the source of the cosmos. Yeah. 
and they layer it over the top of other stories. Mm -hmm. So they go back to stories that are really stories of dragons, mm -hmm. of oppression in human beings, yeah. like draconian entities, and they put the holy name of God over that text. Mm. So even if those awful draconian creatures weren't masquerading as God, yeah. the translators are there too. Gotcha. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Where that ends, I mean, I tell you where that ends up. It ends up with human beings justifying invading each other's countries, enslaving other people groups, yeah. all kinds of misogyny and abuse mm -hmm. in the name of God. Yes. Because that's what God does in the Bible. And they don't realize, no, that's not the behavior of God. That yeah. is a violent colonization. Mm -hmm. You just claim to somebody holy. So real. I'm glad you're on this podcast. This man is speaking real truth. So you don't have to say, oh, Billy's always talking this crazy stuff. I'm talking to a real reverend here, that a person that got so high up in the church. You were just under the level of bishop, correct? Yeah, and actually he's one down from a bishop. And I, you know, when people challenge me and they say, yeah. this is not Orthodox Christianity. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's just slow down. Yeah. Uh, tell me what you mean by Orthodox Christianity, because mm. let's go back to the beginning of Christianity. Let's mm -hmm. talk about origin, mm. the founder, the father of hermeneutics, the principles of Bible interpretation. Yeah. Everyone acknowledges origin as that. Mm -hmm. Clement of Alexandria, Irenaeus, he's the guy who came up with the term Old Testament and New Testament. Mm -hmm. uh, Justin Martyr, you go to those people, they would say what I'm saying yeah. about how to read the, <laughs> the Old Testament stories. Yeah. But unfortunately, some votes went the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Everybody forgets what they said. They were foundational people. Yeah. And this other mainstream took over. And what people call Orthodox Christianity is the mainstream after those votes. Mm -hmm. You go back to the beginning and the first Christians, they knew about contact experiences. It's there in the New Testament, 1 John 4. Yep. They knew about ancestral spirits. It's there in the Bible, in mm -hmm. Hebrews 12. Yep. They knew about beings washing around in the text that were not God. They yep. talked about the craftsmen mm -hmm. who came and terraformed a devastated planet. Mm -hmm. They knew that wasn't a human entity. Yep. They knew about the Elohim and the Yahweh stories not being God's story. Mm -hmm. Origin said, if you read those as God's stories, you'll have to believe of God. Such things you wouldn't believe of the most savage and unjust of men. Mm. He had it absolutely clear. Yes, he did. If we had them in this room, we'd all be singing of the same yeah. Oh, she. Yeah. It's all been forgotten, and Christianity is assumed mm -hmm. to be today's orthodoxy. Right. But in the beginning, it was not. Right. And to add more credence to what uh, Mr. Paul Wallace is saying, if you just simply read the book of Deuteronomy, wipe out the entire town and bring the spoils back to me, why does God need spoils? Exactly. <laughs> and look at what the spoils are. Yeah. Uh, gold, <laughs> beef, land, virgin girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, you read it closely. That's not for the priests. Right. That is for this entity mm -hmm. called Yahweh. Yes. What does he want with those? And it's the same with all the world's dragon narratives. Mm. Interesting. You're shocked to hear me associate those but yeah. anyone who knows the dragon stories where yeah. you're getting them from wales mm -hmm. china russia anywhere else they all follow the same shape mm -hmm. there's a time when our ancestors were governed by non-human entities reptilian entities who wanted those things and they enslaved the people and they would leave the people alone as long as they got all the gold and beef and lamb and virgin girls if they wanted mm -hmm. and human beings lived that way for a while until they realized Wait a minute, if we act together mm -hmm. and if we agree together not to serve this thing, what's it going to do? Can't kill all of us, might kill some of us. Yeah. And they reach a point, and we've seen this in human history, and this happened in the Philippines where the people couldn't be terrorized anymore. Yep. The terror had been used for too long. Yeah. And people reach the point of saying, what are they going to do? They could only kill us. Mm -hmm. And when the people reach that, it pivots into a kind of courage. Yeah. They come together and they say, no, we're not going to work for you any longer. That's it. That story is in the Bible. Mm. Read 1 Samuel 15. Mm. That's when the people come together and they say to Yahweh, no more beef, lamb, gold, virgin girls for you. Mm -hmm. We're going to be led by a human being henceforth. And it was like, um, if I could say the scales falling from my eyes, <laughs> <laughs> I reread that. Text. Yes. 
after doing the research of Alec Ehrlich Young, yeah, and I realized this is a dragon story. Yeah. And that name originally mm -hmm. was associated with a dragon story. And yeah. there are actually phonetic clues mm -hmm. in that name, mm -hmm. but it is a dragon narrative. Now, once you made that switch, mm -hmm. you reread all the stories of the Bible and you recognize there are lessons about people power, the dangers of covert government, mm -hmm. issues of hidden hands and geopolitics. Yeah. It's an incredibly broad education that's in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So to someone coming to me saying, look, the Bible's true, stop messing about with it, I would say, yeah, it's full of powerful information mm -hmm. and we should stop messing about with it. Let's yeah. remember the root meanings right. of <laughs> these stories and learn. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about, man. This is, why this, this is why this guy right here is my hero. Like literally, you have no idea. You know, when you look into the Nag Hammadi and you see uh, information about the um, the Archons, oh, yeah. right? And where they're saying that, for example, one of the Archons resembled this uh, reptilian type being and then another Archon kind of almost resembles a gray alien uh, from the description, at least. It's pretty interesting that they, they supposedly in some way they are able to absorb human energy, negative emotions. Oh, yes. I think that's the most important insight of the Archon stories, yeah. which the original Christians mm -hmm. talked about, so yeah. the Gnostics. They mm -hmm. weren't some add-on or some alternative fringe. They were the original Christians mm -hmm. before Orthodoxy became the mainstream. Yeah. And the thing about an Archon is exactly what you said, Billy. It is an energy-based being mm -hmm. that feeds off the energy of biological life like us. Yeah. And they can influence our thinking and our emotions so that we will go into heavier emotional states, whether that's fear, mm -hmm. anxiety, rage, and then they feed off that. Yeah. And so you would have archons that would manipulate people into going to war mm -hmm. so they can feed off all the misery of that. Yeah. That's in the canonical Bible as well. Mm -hmm. There's a moment where the prophet like high remote views this sky council where all the Elikim are, mm -hmm. and they spend most of their time on that council fomenting war. Yeah. So that those who are energy based can get feed off that. Mm -hmm. And so the, the manipulation of fear is all part of that story. Yeah. And there's a, an entity there that we could call an archon that tricks one nation mm -hmm. into going to war against another on false intelligence. Wow. Sounds Just, familiar. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. So it can feed off all the negative energy. Yeah. And uh, these are great stories. I have to believe them, that there are entities like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, even if you take them figuratively, yeah. there's powerful information in that message. Mm -hmm. uh, in a sense, algorithms behave exactly the same way that Archon's team. That's right. Hey, Bim just got riled by mm -hmm. that post. Let's yeah. send in 10 more. Let's yeah. send more really riled. Then yeah. they start engaging. Yeah. And, same and thing happens. Yeah. We can we can monetize this rage that yep. is now feeling, and I think if you understand how algorithms work, that's a real insight into how our codes work. Mm -hmm. And I happen to believe we are surrounded in a soup of company, mm -hmm. some of whom uh, predate off us in that way. Mm -hmm. And the message, the take kind of messages, you've got to be very intentional about your emotional state. Yeah, if you are beginning to be pulled into a fog, you want to recognize that and check that quickly. Mm. If you're beginning to live angry from morning to morning, yeah. <laughs> recognize that, you want to check that. Mm -hmm. You control your emotional state. Yeah. Don't be manipulated. I mean, if I lived um, if I lived in Fort Lauderdale, mm -hmm. I wouldn't watch the TV. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, on a daily it's basis, uh, I'm, I'm seeing adverts for sickness yeah. on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. All these adverts say, you know, is your water killing you? Yeah. Um, you might not be sick then. <laughs> <all. laughs> you can be sick in a minute. And then all the side effects roll underneath. Yeah, the yeah. So I'd be in a perpetual state of anxiety. And yeah. I did want to go out today. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be very intentional about your intake. Yeah. And just recognize the signs when you're going into not a good emotional state. Mm -hmm. And check it. Do something to get yourself in a better head space. Yeah. Because if you don't, you're going to spiral in one direction or another. Mm -hmm. It won't be benefiting you. No. It'll be benefiting something else. That's so true. That's what uh, Thoth talks about in the Emerald Tablets. He talks about uh, the Dark Brothers. I think these are like the Archons, yes. right? And he talks about take some time to go into a dark space, close the door. If it's a closet or something, just close the door, draw an imaginary circle around you, hold your hands up, and then 
he gives out these specific names, but these are actually frequencies that you're uttering to try to clear your aura and clear your space so you can get back to what you were doing, but in a more positive mindset. And what I try to do is I try to think when I start getting dr drawn in too deep, I separate myself from my thoughts and recognize, hey, wait a minute, what are you doing now? Yeah. And then I try to focus on positive things, things that make me happy, great accomplishments, you know, things that I love, right? People that I love. And that flips, that flips a switch and changes me, pushes me in another direction so I can move forward yeah. instead of staying stuck in that location. Well, I think you, you've got something fantastic going on for you, Billy, mm -hmm. called family. Yeah. <laughs> That's having other people yeah. in your home who you love and care about is a great antidote to those things. Yeah. Because you you know when you're just affecting somebody else in a bad way because you're a grumpy loot of mm -hmm. dealing with all this stuff. And if you've got young kids, as you do, mm -hmm. they pull you out of your fuck. They yeah. pull you out of your headspace because now you've got to do something for them. Yeah. They've always got something important for you to do that <laughs> isn't your thing. And that is such a great gift. Yeah. Other people, that's a phenomenal gift mm -hmm. to us yeah. for our benefit as well as theirs. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Listen, everyone out there, you got to get this book. You got to get all four of the books. And the fifth one coming soon, The Eden Conspiracy. Make sure you go and get this book. It's on Amazon, right? Amazon and Kindle. Amazon and Kindle. All right. So go to Amazon and Kindle. The Eden Conspiracy by Paul Wallace. W-A-L-L-I-S. Make sure you get the book. It's an amazing piece of work. Um, and so I know we were talking, we talked a little bit about like what, what kind of really got you into this, but... You know, when you started looking into the scripture, how did it then lead you to ancient texts and tablets? It was it was the root meanings as as the key words. It was going to words like Elohim, mm -hmm. Elion, El Shaddai, Yahweh. Those are all the words that get translated as God, but it means the powerful ones, the powerful one more powerful than the other powerful ones, mm -hmm. the powerful one, the destroyer. Yeah. And then this name that mm. is a really draconian name mm. and then from there i looked at other words that hint at ancient technology so you've got the loire mm -hmm. you've got the kabod and you've got the burim or the thummim and what's interesting is the technology is being described by people who don't know what it is mm. but they describe it so faithfully yes you and i can read those texts and say yeah that is a drone. Mm -hmm. That is something like a Saturn V. I don't know what they're using. That that's a wormhole. Yeah. Uh, we recognize the phenomena, or we read weapons. There's the um, Katie Mathasal or the Katie Mashital, the yeah. of Ezekiel. Mm -hmm. One it, you translated of uh, the root beings, you get to the shattering thing, the disintegrating mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Apparently, six individuals with the disintegrating thing can ethnically cleanse an entire district. <sighs> Wow. Our ancestors would have read that and thought you can't eat out of a sword. Yeah. Yeah. But you can't even do that with a gun. Mm -hmm. We can read that and picture the kind of technology that's being referenced there. That's yeah. Yahweh's technology, mm -hmm. in case anyone is still thinking. Well, that's right. right. <laughs> and uh, he wanted those people ethnically cleansed yeah. purely because they remembered he was one of many. That's right. And he wanted all the carvings of the sky armies that say the Hashalayim destroyed. Anyone who wouldn't go and show public grief that those carvings existed, mm -hmm. get rid of them. Get rid of them. People read that. They find it hard to imagine. Mm -hmm. But I would just say to them, there are countries mentioning their names in the world today that if you don't go into the public square and show open grief because your great leader is sick or has mm -hmm. died, you run the risk of your whole family being executed. Facts. That's, that's this world in the present. Right now, and 2023. That's the kind of leader Yahweh was mm -hmm. in the book of Ezekiel. Yeah. So all these narratives are there that when you are a preacher and when you translate those as God texts, mm -hmm. you have to tiptoe around them. You know they're, they're crazy. Mm -hmm. And so what I found was as a preacher, I always put that into the, I've got to get back to that basket. Yeah. And then a few years ago, I suffered from an ultimate Frisbee injury. Mm. And uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of a code in my book, actually. Yeah. Okay. And a number of times, yeah. you know, I was uh, fortunate to have the time to drill down into these questions. Mm. I did have an ultimate Frisbee injury mm. at the times as well. Yeah. And I went back to these anomalies. I did the translation. Mm -hmm. And you only have to do the translation work for a couple of days before you realize 
you are in the cuneiform texts of ancient Sumeria, Babylonia, Arcadia, and Assyria. Yeah. Those are the sources of all the biblical stories of Elohim. Yeah. And as soon as you start reading those, mm-hmm. the whole other world opens up. You can't go back and read the Bible in the old way. No. So it was a by degrees change for me. Yeah. I've known there were these problems for a long time. I mm-hmm. suspected there were meetings in the Bible for a yeah. long time. But once I did the translation work, I thought, okay, this is actually a totally new direction of mm-hmm. my work in for the whole foreseeable future. Because yeah. it changes so much of how we live our lives and mm-hmm. how we think about ourselves. It's not just different religious ideas. Yeah. It, it changes your life. Completely changed. I hope you're listening because they've heard me say a lot of this before. And I think it's really important that you heard what he said. He put in the work. He put in the work to do what I've always told you to do. Go research the translations for yourself so that you can make your own educated decision. Yep. And it's, I mean, the translations I use mm-hmm. are the most broadly accepted translations of the cuneiform text. Mm-hmm. That's not me making translations up. Right. That's a mm-hmm. bit of narrative. Right. These are translations that were made in the 18th 18, yes, right. 1890. <laughs> and the, the narratives of ETs were there from that time to yeah. this. Yeah. And it's just a matter of now saying, let's stick to the implications of this. Mm-hmm. You know what's interesting? Um, Edoch is spoken of, of, of high, on high accord in the Bible, but his book is not in the Bible, right? Ah, well, it depends which Bible. Yeah, well, the Ethiopian Bible, I think it's in that Bible. Yeah. That's right. Most Bibles omitted the book of Enoch. Yeah. And I was trying to find out why it was that. And the only thing I could find was, I know that in one section in, in the book of Enoch, he talks about these beings coming down to earth and teaching mankind how to make weapons and teaching them how to uh, make jewelry and perfume and all this kind of stuff. I think that's the reason. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's what it is. And it, it's, it's a scandal in a way that it isn't in the Bible. Mm-hmm. So kudos to the Ethiopian Orthodox Church because they have kept it in the Bible from yeah. the beginning until the present day. Mm-hmm. But I think that it should be because the writer of Jude in the New Testament assumes all his readers have read the book. Mm. And when he quotes the biblical Enoch mm-hmm. from the book of Genesis, he quotes the book of Enoch word for word. Mm. So anyone who takes the New Testament seriously mm-hmm. should be reading the book of Enoch. And I'm pretty sure you're right. The reason it isn't in the mainstream canon is because it contains things that didn't fit the mainstream. Right. So that includes uh, an abduction mm-hmm. narrative. Right. That includes an invasion narrative. Mm-hmm. It includes a detailed unpacking of Genesis 6, which is a hybridization narrative. Yes. And clearly there came a point in the development of Christianity where they thought, this is going to be inconvenient. What we really want here is a religion that's pyramid shaped, mm-hmm. you know, with the emperor. And yeah. God at the top, mm-hmm. and then the people at the bottom paying, praying, and yeah. praying. Yeah. The idea that actually the universe is more complicated, and they all might be having contact experiences, mm-hmm. and they might be getting accurate information from somebody other than their bishop yeah. or the emperor. Mm-hmm. Who can't be dealing with that. Yeah. One news agency only. Yep. Can, can one source of information? We don't want contact as part of the fake, even right. though it's there in the Bible, yeah. 1 John 4. Right. And I think the themes of visitation, hybridization, and what I find really exciting, mm-hmm. more than those, yeah. is a story of humanity's great leap forward. Mm. It says that we went from being uh, creatures that lived in animal subsistence on the planet's surface mm-hmm. to civilization builders. Yeah because of non-human entities who came from outer space and taught us how to do these things. Mm-hmm. And I love that the Book of Enoch mm-hmm. unpacks that enough to say it wasn't just that they taught us about how to do plumbing yeah. <laughs> or how to build a bit tall. Right. It was things like art, mm-hmm. makeup, yeah. adornments, yeah. Right. Uh, more interesting clothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, they taught us how to be a civilization, and we were grateful for their input, and we celebrated them for a long time. Mm-hmm. And in the even conspiracy, I mm-hmm. point out, you go to the prophet Jeremiah, mm-hmm. he tells you openly, there was a time where you could go to every high hill, yeah. and under every green tree, and you'd find an installation saying, thank you to Asherah. Wow. 
who came from outer space right. from the Pleiades to teach our ancestors how to become a civilization. Mm -hmm. And that's primitive Judaism, yeah. a remembrance of that great leap forward and all those who came and helped us. And then you get Jeremiah here, second kings, and a king comes along and he says, I want to obliterate every memory of that. Yeah. I'm going to destroy the carbines. Yeah. I'm going to knock down the temples. Mm -hmm. We're going to illegalize the ceremonies. Mm -hmm. We're going to disband the priesthoods. I'm going to turn this into a religion. One God, mm -hmm. Yahweh, a violent one. Yeah. Because then you can justify anything. In exactly. God. One God, one king, mm -hmm. one temple in Jerusalem. All the ties of the whole nation can come to Jerusalem. Thank you very much mm -hmm. to the high priestly family there. Yeah. Get all the other priesthoods. Right. <laughs> Forget all the other temples yeah. that the kings, the Jewish kings had set up. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people don't know that primitive Judaism was a celebration of paying a call attack. Mm -hmm. And then you get Jeremiah, two kings, and the narrative is yeah. changed so that everyone will forget. Exactly. exactly. Changed by force. Still there. Still there. Yeah. Right, still there. And, you know, one of the biggest things that's always missed with these sacrifices, they wanted to have some nice fresh meat and vegetables because those sacrifices is how they ate their food. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's right. And in fact, there's, a, there's another book that doesn't make it into Western Bible, uh -huh. Bell of the Dragon. Yeah. And it's quite an important book mm. because it clarifies that the food sacrifices were not for the priests. Mm -hmm. The food sacrifices are portioned away to the priests, and then a specified portion goes to the Elohim, uh -huh. including Yahweh, mm -hmm. for them to eat. Exactly. And a specified number of the virgins to the Elohim, including Yahweh, for them to do whatever they want. Yeah. And join the dots. That's you know, not a transcendent God. That's no. the source of the cosmos. No. Needing all that stuff. Yeah. You see, like I always tell you, not the creator of the universe. We're talking about people. Yeah. They're just people. They're with more advanced knowledge, but still people. Hominids of some type. Hominids. Some hominids and yeah. some reptilians. Reptilians. As well. Yes, exactly. Which is interesting because I'm when I study the Ubaid culture out of that region, I have some of the remakes or, or the um the um I guess the uh scale models of some of the artifacts of the Ubaid culture, those reptilians. Yes. Yes. Uh, you know, there's so many of them they found. Some had staff, some had loins, some were naked. So I'm thinking that those probably were the working class, the naked ones. Yes. Um, so some are, a, one, a woman is breastfeeding a baby, but they have the reptilian head, the scales, and yeah. they found some of these structural remnants of their ancient structure still there. So this was a real culture that existed and lived on this planet. Yes. And, you know, I love to hear the mainstream academic explanations yeah. of these things. Mm -hmm. Sometimes. Hilarious. Yeah, they're hilarious. Oh, they're really <laughs> funny. It's just the inconsistency. That yeah. You point to one carving. Well, that shows what, what the people saw. Yeah. This office is completely made up. Right. <laughs> I know. That's just a fabrication. Get to that. Yeah, they wanted to make an entire uh, mo uh, you know mockery of a potential civilization that will never probably. No, they just yeah. what they created with these statuettes was what they actually encountered. Exactly. And I believe those statues might have even have been created by the Ubaid culture themselves. Yes, I think that's very possible. Yeah. From what I see, I think you're on the right track. There. Yeah. And of course, the academics do the same with representations of ancient technology. Mm -hmm. So if you go to Mesoamerica yeah. and you find all these carvings representing what looks like space helmets, right. what looks like what we would call a Bluetooth mm -hmm. microphone earpiece, if you ask the guides in the museum, why did they carve that? Yeah. The answer is, well, those are symbols that imply advancement, mm -hmm. higher intelligence. Mm -hmm. And so the kings, the, the priestly kings and queens, you know, wear these so they look like the advanced being. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Is that what the advanced beings wore then? Yeah. Oh, I didn't mean it literally. Uh. Oh, hold on. <laughs> Why does something like a blue tune is represented by Why yeah. does something like breathing apparatus represent mm -hmm. the blood? Something like a uh, hell of a space yeah. helmet, something like a space shuttle. Mm -hmm. Why did they pick those symbols yeah. to indicate advancement? You you just go the extra step with your question, mm -hmm. and you will have stumped. Yeah, oh, there you can see the steam coming out of their ears. Yeah, that's right. What we're talking about, sir, ma'am, is a cargo cult. Exactly. We're talking about 
a, a more advanced society that engaged a less advanced society and that less advanced society deified them and now are trying to mimic them exactly. by any means necessary, just like they did oh. in the atolls in the French Polynesia. I love that you said by any means necessary. Yeah. Because the clue for me that it is a cargo cult we're looking at. If you look at the Jaguar dynasty, for instance, mm -hmm. and one of the people and these depictions I was just mentioning, you will have, say, Queen Shook freaks. Mm -hmm. She'll be wearing that Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. But it's not working because mm -hmm. uh, they don't know how to make it work. They, yeah. they put something together that looks like what the advanced beings wore, mm -hmm. but it's not achieving remote communication. Yeah. And you know that because she's simultaneously doing a bloodletting mm. to evoke an altered state of consciousness mm -hmm. so that she can have a contact experience. Yeah. Now, I don't know about your blue cheese. <laughs> I don't have to do a blood No, we are not doing any blood so It's a little clue that they, they are copying technology they've seen, mm -hmm. that they don't know how to replicate, mm -hmm. and they know that the goal is remote communication. Yeah. And uh, so I think, yeah, so that you're... Yeah, I think. I think we can kind of see this across the board, all around the, all around the world. Forget the United States, all around the world. You look into the Americas, for example, and the Mayan culture, you see that they inherit these super advanced civilizations. However, they're still uh, pulling people's hearts out of their chest. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah, it's funny. People often say to me, hold on, you're saying the Mayans had all this advanced information about the birds beings. How come they were so brutal? Yeah. Well, again, it goes back to there was a time when we were governed brutally. Mm -hmm. Just because these beings had better tech than us, didn't make them better than us. It just meant they could govern over us. Yeah. And sometimes they did it with brutality, and mm -hmm. we, we just copied what we saw. That's it. And this is how we made to power over others. Mm -hmm. So you've got stories in the Bible of Elohim, because they can get a human being to sacrifice their child. Mm -hmm. Well, now they know they've got total control. Yeah. And I think human leaders have copied that technique from that time to this. Mm -hmm. And that's why you can go back to at times in my history, yeah. and that's what the human leaders did. Right, was exactly. That was it. And yeah. terrorization. Mm -hmm. because I don't want to go to, this yeah. is a very dark yeah, strategy here, but there has always been an aspect of the higher-ups terrorizing oh, yeah. ordinary people and benefiting from their terror in various ways. Listen, if you go back and look at the Sumerian version of Yahweh, which is Enlil, in uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, right? So the Epic of Gilgamesh is the true and full story of Noah's Ark and Zizudra and, and, and Gilgamesh and, and his created uh, friend that went along with him on this hero's journey and he's looking for Zizudra. But long story short, in there Enlil begins to get angry because the human beings are making a little bit too much noise. This is Yahweh, by the way. Kill them off. Here's the first occurrence of Kim Trails. He literally says, spray their fields, dry out the crops, starve them to death. You know, so we're talking about uh, a being who's being looked upon as a God, yeah. who whenever he gets good and ready, decides, oh, just call these humans off. Just, just re remove, there's just too many, just too much noise. Oh, they're always hungry, they're always clamoring about, he goes, just kill some more. So you see this brutal, what you're talking about, this yeah. brutal way of ruling over them, showing them that their life was completely worthless and meaningless to them, yeah. and they yeah. would just kill them off whenever they wanted to. Exactly. So he's he's there saying they're too many of them, they're too noisy, call them yeah. for the sake. Yeah. And so he does that spray. Mm -hmm. There's a spray story in the modern tradition as well. Oh, wow. Where the progenitors, as they're mm. called, who are reptilians, mm. feathered serpents, they began to say, these human beings are just too much. They're too difficult to manage. They're actually too intelligent. Mm. We didn't leave in this cloud. And so they go back to the chief to that again to end, which is Kukuvats, yeah. Salkotl, Kukukan. Mm -hmm. Can you dumb them down? Mm -hmm. And he comes up with a vapor. Mm -hmm. And when sprayed over human populations, mm -hmm. brain damages them. Wow. Sort of they're limited to the immediate... Uh, surroundings, their five physical senses, mm -hmm. and beyond that, they'll have to rely on an authority to tell them what's going on. Mm -hmm. We can work with that, they said. Yeah. So, I mean, goodness me, the 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 brutality of brain damaging a oh. whole population so you can manage them is a very, very similar ethic. Mm -hmm. And you talk about Enlil being the Alpha character. He is sometimes in yes. some of the yeah. Alpha narratives, and it's often in the nasty narrative. Yeah. So is there in the flood narrative mm -hmm. as well? It's Enlil, he says, we'll kill them all with a flood. Mm -hmm. And then Enki, 
he is closer to the human beings because yeah. he's in charge of Project Earth and he wants to rescue Project Humanity. Mm -hmm. And so he comes up with the rescue plan of the, yeah. the Pishtim, as you said, right? No, right. Uh, yeah. After Harsis. Yeah. And that's how the story goes. So you've got um, the younger brother, Enlil, he's is awful. And then Enki does a rescue job. Yeah. But what happens in the Bible is worse mm -hmm. because Yahweh is Enlil and Enki. Right. They combine some of the, 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 yeah. the two attributes together. So he's actually double minded. Yes. So he makes the humans and then changes his mind. Right. He's sorry for what he did. <laughs> <laughs> and you created this insane monster. And yeah. then, if you want to stay in the mainstream of uh -huh. Christianity, you have to justify it. Yeah, you have to justify it. I'd say, well, that's fine. Yeah, that's, don't, don't, that's question, not, don't question right. God. Don't question God. That's don't right. question God. And so there we are. Yeah. You, you really have to suppress your entire conscience yeah. to take that as a God story. I did a video recently on the Paul Wallace channel with the title of Did Jesus Worship Yahweh? Mm. It got a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. but I pointed out in that video that if you want to read those stories as God stories, mm -hmm. the only way you can do it yeah. is to start justifying awful things, wrong. start justifying genocide. And I had a whole heap of people coming on and saying, yeah. there's nothing wrong with genocide if God done <laughs> it. I, I, I had the same thing. For my point. <laughs> I did a video called, Could the God of the Bible be Satan? Yeah, so it's the same message. Same, same message. I think it's in a million, two million views or something. But yeah, same thing. A lot of the comments were like, people were going, you know, no, this is what God, this is how it was back in the day and it was okay. And I'm like, yeah, no, it's not okay. No, it's not okay. Not okay. And this is why, you see, Christians are entrained to believe there's continuity between the, the yeah. stories of the Elohim, stories of Yahweh, even what Jesus is all about. Mm -hmm. And it's not continuity. No. Jesus came to set people free. Yeah. And he sets people free from Yahwism, mm -hmm. which is why when you get to Acts 15, the apostles are all saying Christianity is not built on Yahwism. To get faith in those laws or belief in those stories, Christianity is going to be built on something else. It's, the only way they can come to that decision mm -hmm. was because Jesus put clear blue water between his idea of God, the source of the cosmos, yeah. and these awful, violent stories of beings who came and stole and killed and destroyed, yeah. these awful stories of the father of lies and the one who was the murderer from the beginning. He's not talking about the source of the cosmos. Yeah. No. When he called Theos father, daddy, yeah. he's talking about the Elohim and Yahweh stories. And right. Don't like them. Exactly. Powerful, powerful stuff. We got to have you on here a lot more often, man. That's a good idea. Yeah, because this man is a wealth of real knowledge. You can tell by the way he speaks. He's done his research. He's invested countless hours of time to learn what he's been able to regurgitate back to us today. He's done the work. He's gone and done the research and the work he's gotten his hands dirty, which is what every single one of us needs to be able to do. We need to be able to go and research the things that we're believing in, especially if you're counting on these things you're believing in to lead you into eternity. You should know what you're looking at, what you're worshiping, what you're being part of, and what you've created or, or built your entire belief system around. Like I always say, I do believe that there's a God. I believe there's a creator of the universe because the quantum physics proves that we're living in a creation. Yes. I'm just saying, and I think you're just saying that some of the text that's been left behind for us to read and think that it's God may not be the real creator of the universe. Maybe just advanced men who put on their pants one leg at a time, just like us, that had an agenda yes. to put their boot on the neck of mankind. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. I think there's a wonderful definition of God that I find in the New Testament mm. of the Apostle Paul, because he's talking to a non-religious audience one time, and he says, by God I mean, or by Theos mm -hmm. I mean, the source of the cosmos and everything in it, that in which we all live and move and have our being, mm. of which we are all offspring, as one of your own poets has said. Mm. And what I love about that definition, there's no anxiety. No. There's no separation anxiety. Mm -hmm. It's not you are separated from God until yeah. you had to claw your way back into the kingdom. <laughs> no, you are an emanation of God. You're an expression of God. Your thoughts are an mm -hmm. expression of divine intelligence. Your consciousness, an emanation of source culture. You couldn't be closer to God than you are. It's something to learn, mm -hmm. to enjoy, and actualize mm -hmm. and i like by that such an empowering vision and we have detracted from it by yeah. so much of our religious tradition to yeah. get back to the root meanings and it all becomes crystal clear
Wow, so powerful. Can you tell everyone where they can find you? Yes, you can find me at fistkind.tv. Go there if you'd like to support our work. Come to poorantonywallace.com if you're interested in coaching. That will keep you up to date with everything else. You can go to Amazon for the Eden series. The latest book is An Eden Conspiracy. You can buy it at Amazon and Kindle. And the Paul Wallace channel on YouTube as well. And they're in the comments every day. So very easy to get in a conversation with. And I will keep my eyes peeled for you. All right. Fantastic. We'll see you again soon on the Forbidden Knowledge Podcast. Third Eye Love.